got it. <laughs> Welcome to Binary Jazz, uh, a show where uh, we try to get it. We we'll try to get you to get it. I don't know. That's that's not that's nothing. There's nothing there. Um, this is a podcast. We do it every week. Uh, we've been doing it for a while, and uh, we don't know what we're going to talk about before we talk about it. And that's sort of how the the podcast works. Um, historically, there was a format, but we're kind of throwing that out the window. And it's 2023, and people got shit to do. Oh. I actually have questions for I, as you're speaking that I actually realized I have questions for you. So keep going. Oh, good, excellent. We all we love questions. You can submit questions uh, through the I'm website on, so uh, on binaryjazz.com, dot com, or um, I guess you could submit them through Twitter. Although I kind of le- I kind of just uh, posted a, a signing off from Twitter tweet uh, the other day because I just don't open it anymore. So I think that probably if you if you mastodon if you tooted at us on mastodon. We do have a Mastodon thing. It's like at binary jazz at uh, mstdn dot social. Then uh, then the I problem is we also send a, a messenger pigeon to yeah, messenger carrier Joel. pigeon. Yeah. <laughs> the problem with Mastodon, in my opinion, is that it just seems like a complete parody of Twitter. When you say you can toot at us, like you've totally lost. Like tweeting, yourself, <laughs> but you can toot at. I'm like, I think. I mean, I think they are. The I think they are trying to downplay the toot language. I think that, like, there. I think I saw a discussion a while ago about just calling them posts instead of toots because toots are too close to like tweets, and it's just like, well, but that's dumb, and you're just doing a thing because they did a thing, and it makes you sound stupid because toots are also farts. Yeah. Yep. Are either of you on Blue Sky? Have you heard anything no. about that? Okay. I'm curious. Are, are you on Blue Sky? No, no. Okay. I you need an invitation and Yeah, I I I have I'm avoided cool all the invitation. other sort of like new Twitter replacements other than Macedon because it felt like Macedon was the place to go if I was gonna go any place. Mm-hmm. Um I I think that one of the problems with Twitter, I mean replacing Twitter, not Twitter. There's a ton of problems with Twitter. <laughs> you know it was sort of like lightning in a bottle it was like here's this spot and we had a lot of years to cultivate like voice on it right Mm -hmm. and it ended up being this thing where it was like the great equalizer where you could get ceo of company and like you know producer you know seven levels down or whatever and could like have a dialogue and in the voice that they established for themselves and then insert a, a gif of fry mooning or whatever and that was part of the the landscape and it was acceptable um, and then like upsetting the apple cart with like validating who you are and blah, blah, blah. And messing with the algorithm. Like, Hey, I'm just amazed at like how little engagement I've had on a couple of tweets recently. Like, not that I ever had a ton, but like crickets type. I'm like, Oh, all right. There's no reason to be here. Like is, is ultimately what it's become. Um, yeah, like, it's well, effectively and, dead. It's, and, it's on life support, but it's been the, dead for a while the the thing that has, has sort of killed it for me is um i i worked really hard to curate the list of people i was following to be like people that i cared to follow and maybe i i got a little bit sloppy at the end but like i go there and like first of all the feed is not my curated feed anymore mm-hmm. like it's it's that but also things that are related which is not something that i care about like i i worked really hard to to make sure that this was people that i wanted to hear from um and then people are like like spending so much time doing their social media marketing that like like i you know i respect you as a human being but i don't want to see your bullshit about your company like you know like i want to have like i came here for conversation yep. and like i go there now and everything is just like you know i don't i like i look at it I literally like i opened i i will open it up for, and i look at it for five seconds and like nope and <laughs> like that that's my that's my twitter experience now is is opening it and just saying nope um i and, and i find yeah and there was like there you know the early days of twitter were like like this is what i'm eating or working on something cool or like you know, auto tweet from my Winamp player or like, you know, uh, it was stupid shit for really, really long. This is what my plant is doing. My plant needs my, the, the, there was, there was, I remember there was a bot that was somebody's washing machine and told them when the washing was done. And like, people were doing really stupid shit with it. And, and like, I don't know, I kind of miss the stupid shit that people did with it. 
Which reminds me, Spacebot still going strong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened. I thought we were shutting down bots, but I'm just like, I'm just over here. Mm -hmm. I got an email when, uh, and it's kind of killed my excitement about drone control, but I got an email about, uh, first I was, I no longer had API access for that account. Same. Um, and like an estimated invoice of some thousand dollars a month. And I'm like, all right, well, taking that Twitter code out of the bot. <laughs> so please share your secrets. Actually, don't, I'm not going to get that. No, I got an email too, but nothing seemed to happen. So maybe I'm getting charged billions of dollars. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but they're U.S. dollars, and they don't they don't translate into Canadian dollars. Yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't respect USD <laughs> unless it's landing in my bank account. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um. So, uh, thing that I did want to talk about maybe, um, is that um, this is Gavin's last year of quote unquote high school. He's been unschooled yeah. since like third grade or something. And so he's graduating this year and we wanted to mark the occasion because graduation is important. And so Aaron and I have been thinking about like a, a like a graduation ceremony and like commencements. And I've been thinking about commencement speeches, speeches, uh, like what even is one? Because like, we're going to be doing a thing probably we'll be saying something. So uh, as, as is, you know, the usual for me these days, um, I asked an artificial intelligence. I asked, actually asked no. two artificial intelligences. Um, <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> I'm not going to read them. I'm not going to read them. Uh, but I asked two different artificial intelligences to, to <laughs> write me a, uh, a commencement speech um, for a student named Gavin who is interested in these subjects, who has these hobbies, and who has been unschooled. Um, yeah and uh bard was really robotic and bad um yeah. but open ai uh chat gpt was pretty darn good and actually had some some legit stuff that i might want to steal like it was it was <laughs> like... really good and and so it made me it made me think about like um and so this is what i wanted to sort of bring here is like i don't remember like anything from any commencement speech i have ever been to ever <laughs> Um, oh, the only the only exception say. the only exception is um, so when I graduated college, um, we had our own sort of commencement ceremony, and each person who was in the graduating class, and it's probably like thirty people or something in in our small program, um, would choose like I think maybe I think two speakers um, that would then be their commencement speakers. Um, so you got to choose and it could be a faculty, it could be a friend, it could be a parent, it could be whatever. So I chose uh, my best friend and roommate uh, to speak and I chose my dad. Um, and I don't really remember what my roommate said, but I do remember that he drew a thing that I still have in my like, you know, uh, uh, diploma holder thing. Um, and I remember the only thing I remember about what my dad said was that um, uh, reflecting on how uh, when I was in high school and maybe a little bit younger, I used to give him uh, mixtapes called Dad's Father's Day tape um, of like <laughs> stuff that I thought he would like, stuff that I was listening to, but also stuff that I thought that, that he would enjoy. Um, and uh, I did that several years and he was just talking about how that was sort of, you know, important and that like it showed that I like cared and like was paying attention and so he made me a graduation tape uh that he gave me at at the commencement and then that sort of led to me like making a bunch of mixed cds over the next several father's days until you know cds didn't exist anymore um and uh and th that's what i that's what i remember ultimately is is that um which then also kind of begs the question what is even commencement speech for like what do you like like i know it's I like it's for the parents of whoever's graduating yeah. <laughs> generally so like if we're the parents and we're doing this thing for our kid and it's only for us then what the hell like we shouldn't like we, we it needs to be something else well have you asked have you asked gavin of course not <laughs> <laughs> I, like um, I, I'm just like wondering what he would like out of it. Like, yeah. when, does he want like a cornball some speeches? Does he want? I oh, don't no, know. Not, not that it should be left entirely up to a teenager because. Well, the thing is that he does, weird he, decisions. There's but... so little context, right? Like from yeah. for any sort of school tradition, like anything like that has been just completely absent for you know 
But that's kind of exciting. So that means yeah. it doesn't have to actually fit into any of those. Well, and that's and that's that's kind of the cool thing too, is that like that's kind of how um like we modeled our our wedding ceremony on um uh there like at the end of a uh semester there was uh no at, at graduation like before graduation there was a process of like inviting like faculty that you worked with or um and and friends and things to to basically talk about your progress as a student um and to just sort of like reflect on like the learning journey and this was before commencement um and uh sort, sort of, of like, like an academic like this is your life yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> where you presented your your graduation contract which said i set out to do these things this is what i did and everybody's graduation contract like graduation contract was a very vague vaguely defined uh thing where it could be anything it could be a work of art it could be like whatever um mine was sort of like a mishmash collage of different sort of narratives um and uh Gosh, I and, wish I went to that university. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like thinking I, back to my university experience and I'm like, man, I was struggling. <laughs> and so and so we sort of modeled our, our wedding ceremony on that a little bit where we're like we just sat around in a circle and invited people to speak if they wanted to. And we ourselves said things to each other. And um, and that was kind of it. Like we had already done the paper, like we had already gotten married yeah. legally. So like it was just it was, just, you know, a thing. You didn't have between... to check any of the technical boxes. Yeah, you'd exactly. Done it, so. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'm trying to think. I, I don't really, I don't remember anything from my high school graduation. Yeah, I remember um, nothing other than that my, my bio mom was not there. That's what I remember from that. <laughs> I should, like, I remember the aftermath and I remember like, but I don't remember like speeches. I think I was just too stressed out. Um, yeah, just too stressed out. <laughs> generally the Alice and Tar story. <laughs> too stressed out, the Alice and Tar story. Personally, I was just really excited that I was actually graduating. And again, the speech was not. Do you think I if there was. I remember that it was an author and I feel like, <laughs> or maybe that was Robin's graduation. I don't know. Do you, do you, th <laughs> do you think if, if you were not as stressed out, because I think that was probably true for me too. Um, do you think if you didn't have that emotional charge to the event that you would be more likely to, to retain the event itself or do you think that the event itself the way that it's formatted and structured normally is so generic and like kind of inherently boring that you it would just like slip out of your mind anyway can it be a little column a a little column b like <laughs> i feel like there's a lot of well for me there was a lot of stress to like i mean I, my high school graduation was a generally small class of like 70, 60 people. Um, and university conversely was like a thousand people. Mm -hmm. So like the opposite <laughs> or, of my or experience. More. Yeah. Like it was like split up into sections because there was just no time. Um, but both, both were somehow not that personal. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so they somehow managed. I remember um, two commencement speeches. Um, one I was not actually at, <laughs> so, and I'll share that in a minute. The first one is uh, my when my brother graduated from high school, like boring. But we we had to sit in an auditorium, and it was super stupid hot, and it was like two thousand seven, maybe, and um, like you know, there was nothing special about it except whoever the valedictorian was gave a speech and quoted John Mayer's. Waiting in the world to change, which was like a year old at that point, yeah. um, which I thought how cliche. But then I listened to it and thought it's really interesting. This is the charge that this like age is taking on, and felt a little optimistic. That's it, a little optimism. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. Little, I mean, that's more optimism. that's more than I emerged with my memories. I don't have that. <laughs> and I, I had to Google it to make sure I got it right. But O five Kenyon College, David Foster Wallace. This is water. I'm sure you've heard it. If you've not, make it a point to listen to because it's excellent. I feel like I, yeah, I feel like I've learned more from other like famous commencement speeches than any of the ones that I actually attended. And I'm, as an audience member, I feel like it's a lot easier to take it in and absorb it than someone yeah. who's like sitting there in your robe or whatever and being like, oh God, everybody's so watching. So, so what makes, what makes a good commencement speech? 
I feel like I brevity. love humor. Brevity. Well, I do <laughs> yeah, think that's brevity. Part of it, you know? I mean Transparency. When when do we when do we sit and listen to someone give speeches other than like in a classroom? But mm -hmm. like this is a broad spectrum of people. So like what's the opportunity that and, and what's the content that will appeal to this broad spectrum of people? You have to be, you know, I think brevity helps. I, I say that without humor, but I, I do think that helps. You know, you have to find like a single nugget of truth that you hone in on and and build the whole thing around that. I also think that like some people just give better speeches. <laughs> like they've got the they've got the way to connect with the audience within the first two to three sentences. And some people have it from practice and experience and some people just aren't like, I think I'm pretty sure the, the woman who gave the speech at my high school graduation was like an alumni who, but like, I don't feel like, you know, some people just aren't used to giving speeches. They can be brilliant. They can be mm -hmm. really interesting, but the speech giving is like a whole, it's a skilled, whole other discipline. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to give a speech somewhere. I'm not. Oh, Jeez, sign me up. Put yeah, me up there. sorry, sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Give me like a day's notice, and I'll I'll kill it. I'm ready to go. I don't even care who it is. Like, we. I feel like starting off okay. with something like Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines success. As... God, you already <laughs> lost me. You yeah, show me the dictionary definition, yeah. and I'm like, my phone is out. I'm like, what? <laughs> what's going on on Twitter? That's at least somewhat interesting these days. <laughs> Um, so, so Gary has shared, uh, in our Slack that he has started watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And if there are any Buffy the Vampire Slayer listeners or listeners at all, uh, who have opinions about Buffy the Vampire Slayer or specifically opinions about Joss Whedon, I would ask that you, uh, hold back your ire until Gary finishes Golly. the series. Uh, because there's a lot of drama there and I don't want to ruin the show for you. Um, because the show is truly magical and it's just really unfortunate that things suck in the world. That our sucks. faves are problematic. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, that. I um I will say that I picked Buffy as to replace an X Files hole in my So opinion. you've never seen Buffy ever? I've never seen it. Okay. So this is a completely I'm, fresh uh yep. Buffy experience as an adult watching a show that is mostly designed for like high schoolers uh sort of coming of age sort of thing so yes uh i i i this i this is this is an awesome uh experiment <laughs> I, I would love to seen, hear your thoughts i have not seen the entirety of buffy i, I would probably i've petered i petered off probably where people argued that it got good like not <laughs> that it wasn't good before, but that it like increasingly yeah. got better. Yeah, that's actually where I stopped. <laughs> is there a so, reason why that's where you stopped, or is that honestly just, just access to TV? Yeah, um, wasn't happening. <laughs> so, yeah. and then I, I don't. I've never it. like pursued pursued to get it back. I guess. So. Oh, 144 episodes. Okay. Well, and then you, you also need to include Angel too. I do have a friend that does a Buffy rewatch and then she sprinkles in the appropriate Angel episodes yeah. chronologically. Yeah. 110 of Angel? Yeah, so you and and I wasn't so even you, aware Angel was a thing. Yeah, so like there's a there's a point, I think it's like even maybe season 2 or 3 where Angel leaves for LA and then the two series run concurrently and I think they basically ended at the same time. Um, and for a while, particularly in those early seasons of Angel, there was a lot of like story crossover and then Angel kind of just broke off and did its own thing for, for the rest of its, its run. Um, but it's, it's really, it's really good. And they both kind of fill a little bit of a, a different niche. Um, they're both, they're both like monster of the week sort of, uh, Oh, I love shows. that. Obviously. Um, and it, although Angel takes a little bit more of a, you know, you know, gritty private eye kind of approach, whereas Buffy is a lot more um, like campy, but also, um, you know, more like personal relationship, high school and going into college kind of uh, transition and coming of age kind of things. Um, the yeah. campiness is great. It's great. I, like episode, halfway through episode two, I'm like, 
I thought maybe I just wasn't getting it episode one, but no, this is like maybe like it's like a language thing that's changed from the late nineties till now. But no, it's totally it's it's wonderful. We we recently now that I rewatched how it's metered out. We recently rewatched the Buffy movie. Um mm. which it's a movie. Yeah. Well the movie came first and then the show was No. Yeah. The huh. the movie came first and then like two or three years after that, maybe even longer than that, um, the show was was greenlit. And the show kind of sort of is extended from the movie, but it's a lot deeper in lore. And if you tried to like draw a direct line from the movie to the show in terms of like the world building and stuff like it's not it's not a very smooth transition there's stuff that like kind of changed as like the the, the show kind of changed a couple of things it kind of it was almost like a reboot a little bit um but there were things like it and it's discussed like things that happened in the movie did in fact happen in the show or like in in the past um as as sort of like context but it's like it's sort of it was built to be its own independent thing um, sorry i'm i'm super like i'm a super big buffy nerd so this is so this yeah, is like my exciting it's not in hd like well yeah let's get on that let's get an hd um who is this where, weird thing at the what's that oh i was gonna ask where whereabouts have you just watched the first few episodes is that where you are i made it through episode five and i was starting episode six oh. last night yep so there's an episode and hyenas uh, if you remember the hyenas episode yeah, that's good. Have you gotten to the John Ritter one? So good. No. Um, the John Ritter one is good. I think it's in the first uh, the first season. Um, but uh, there is an episode. Uh, let me see where it's at. Season probably six. Probably mentioned to people that there will be spoilers. Yeah, spoilers. <laughs> well, I'm trying not to. Yeah, uh, I'm season... not to for, for Gary's sake. <laughs> in, in season six. There's an episode called Once More with Feeling, um, which is basically where they do, they randomly just do a musical episode. Um, and this is before such a thing as Schmigadoon, like Schmigadoon is the new yeah. like uh, Apple TV show uh, that's basically just a musical randomly, like every, you're living in the musical. Um, this was sort of like the first, yeah, this is the first okay. television show that, that did that thing sort of ever. Um, and what is... Like, Do you remember when they did it on Scrubs? Because that was pretty well executed. What What is, to me, most remarkable about Once More with Feeling is obviously it's dumb. Obviously it's campy. Um, but also, like, there is such a heavy emotional impact. Like, that is one of the most emotionally impactful episodes of the entire series. Like, and, and oh, arguably, like, in tv like it was it's really good especially if you have all the context of like everything like the story up to that point and like like where it's amazing um and it that's that's sort of like where buffy for me went from being this is a cool fun tv show to being like no this is fucking a lifestyle <laughs> like this is <laughs> this is this is like i feel like we found your trigger point for like things chris could write a thesis on <laughs> <laughs> so, and you said that's in season six season six yeah okay um while we're while we're on the topic of uh, uh emotional tv shows are you all ted lasso watchers and oh, yeah. ted lasso yeah we oh, don't man. Have Not this TV. Wednesday. <laughs> but the wednesday prior with colin was like mm. oh yeah where he came out yes yeah Yes, so wonderful. What a, what a great episode. Props to the writers. I mean, I think that the I think the way that that was handled, and also like um, uh, using the reporter who becomes just uh, and somebody who follows the team around to write a book on them, um, and becomes sort of an ally, uh, just like a quiet like uh, person on the sidelines, and using him as a way to talk about what coming out is life and being an ally for for colin's character uh in the show um i thought that was uh really really good because it was it was sort of this like yeah i'm on the outside too but i'm like also have been where you are and i'm you know uh yeah i i, th I thought that like without that like you know it's a locker room full of like dudes and that's obviously hard to then talk about homosexuality um without that sort of like um you know outside kind of mentor character 
Mm-hmm. Well, and it wasn't just a single episode. It wasn't like a setup yeah. solved in right. an hour ish. You know, it, it's it, like it's well, been it's not part solved of, it's either. Part of fabric yeah. Of yeah. Well, I guess that's what I'm saying is that it's 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 just it's the character. It's mm-hmm. not the topic. And yeah. I think that there's a big difference. Um, it's um, what season uh, is Ted Lasso on currently? Three. Three. Mm-hmm. And they're not long seasons. They're like ten episodes, I think. Um, so it's it's for twelve. It's maybe it's bingeable, yeah. Um, what were your questions, Gary? Okay. Or did you want to talk about? Or did you want to talk about uh, entertainment tropes like the mom and puppy? Oh my gosh! Uh, so I guess both. the first question. <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's go down that path. Is is does she stay that way? Because it's 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 so good. It's just like <laughs> it's like you took parents out of any like late eighties, early nineties movie and just flop them in. Like it's it, like oblivious happy-go-lucky like they definitely do more with her character they definitely do more with her character later on i think the first season like and the the first season of buffy is actually a half season anyway because it actually started mid mid mid-year um which is the reason why it's shorter um and the first season they're kind of just getting their sea legs and they're kind of trying to still figure out like how they want to approach what buffy as a tv as a TV show is and what's important. And I think the second and third seasons, they really start to like find their bearing and like create that world around them and dig more into like this idea of, um, you know, the, the vampire slayer, the one chosen one. And it's always like, like for each age, there's a, there's a single girl that's been chosen or whatever. And like the whole mythology around that sort of stuff. Um, But like at the beginning, it's really just like trying to kind of, almost satire like saved by the bell sort of things like yes you know like be the real yeah. like campy high school sort of thing and just with monsters um and so i, I do think that like wow. they, they it, it evolves but but yeah i, I don't say that's think probably they, why i had no interest i feel like their energy the first season isn't about expanding the mom character at all so yeah she for sure of, she definitely falls into this perfectly stenciled <laughs> It was like a Buffy was going out to the club or something, and uh, her mom was like, "I don't know, like, no, you're grounded or whatever." And, uh, and Buffy said something. She's like, "I know at your age, everything seems like it's life and death." And it was just like, it's just like so over the top. And I'm like dying laughing. It's it's very much <laughs> I like expect that. I, I feel like you could swap. Uh, what's her name? Joyce. I think feel like you could swap her with the mom character in uh in uh my so-called life and yes. there would be no you, no discernible changes do you remember the parents um in the movie war games not really <laughs> so this like is this is gary's having... thesis topic is yeah. war games yeah war games yeah <laughs> I was thinking about that this morning too and realizing next next Ben Jazz conf it's going to be just completely <laughs> like media focused. Okay. I'm a, I'm down. Um there's a scene where they're eating like family dinner and uh like the father takes the corn and he rubs it in the butter and he takes a bite into it. He's like he's like it's raw and his mom's like I know isn't it so nice and crunchy? He's like it's raw and it's just this like ridiculous stupid <laughs> jokey thing that doesn't make any sense at the time it happens in the movie you're like what? <laughs> um those that's the parent that's the quintessential late 80s early 90s parent trope like I, <laughs> it's so great um all right so what are your questions gary in the okay. last 10 minutes of the show well, you yes both um uh experienced catholics oh oh <laughs> experienced yes. we are that's experienced so catholics really... or we experience the concept of catholics we, that's a really I don't think it matters. diplomatic way of saying <laughs> what you're trying to say. Well, What's fun about that is we're both like sort of recovering Catholics. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just I just meant you have knowledge. Uh, you were beaten with knowledge. <laughs> beaten with knowledge. Uh, Accurate. Um, yeah. Um, the Apocrypha. Did you read the Apocrypha? No. Do you know the Apocrypha? The Apocrypha is the tail end of the old testament mm. it, timeline it's it's books and they're generally not considered biblical canon because often they have nothing to do with uh 
God. So um, I read that, I read uh, some of the Apocrypha recently um, in parallel with this book that I've been working on for months, six months. It's only like four essays, but six months on um, Old Testament theology and uh, intersectionality and feminism. Um, anyway, the point there, I swear to God, there's a point um, is there's, uh, but you haven't read it. Um, there's a book called Ben Sirah and the Wisdom of Solomon or Ecclesiastic Cuss. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesi- yeah, whatever. I don't know if it's Cuss or Key. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Yes. I'm sure yeah. nobody listening cares either. Yeah. The <laughs> concept is um, both present the concept of wisdom as a woman, which is not a new concept, um, but but very well documented lots of writing. These are, I think they're probably worth a read. Um, both are problematic because they're written um, by men in a very misogynistic time. So wisdom as a woman is certainly flawed, but also the concept of wisdom as a spirit. And I'm like, I'm jamming with that concept, right? So I'm not sure what the question was out of this. <laughs> Thoughts. <laughs> Gary's question corner has failed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got a little off the track. Thoughts. Especially since you haven't read the book. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, so. Can we define wisdom first? Maybe we should do that. It's always Is hard for me. Knowledge? It's always hard for me to separate um, the way Christian-based religions present ideas about things like that separate from the sort of pagan source code that they forked um, in order to gain conversions Um, the like there's there's this whole thing about like you know there is this i think I want to say Welsh or Celtic uh, goddess Bridget, and she became Saint Bridget in the UK, um, just so they could just so they could get people over. And it's like, oh yeah, we 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 know about her. She's she's a saint. Like she's a saint now. Um, and so like when, because I don't like I feel like a lot of that sort of like ideas around like contextualizing a, a two thousand year old document. Um, are a lot of um like reinterpreting things to fit with like what existed in the time like at the time and like th- like yeah, yeah so like i i it's it's always hard like you know the whole like i i see i see direct ties from like day of the dead um to also like you know pagan observances of you know how we celebrate our ancestors and things and how we respect spirits and the you know fairy world or other you know that sort of thing so it's always hard for me to separate those out um as being like distinctly part of the canonical like this is this is part of this particular doctrine because i'm looking at it and like well you have these influences over here so i'm gonna go over there because that's where that stuff comes from you know that's where i that's where i sort of lean i guess i should throw in too that that the apocrypha is accepted in as canon in the catholic church and many protestant denominations see it as heretical Mm -hmm. so it's a it's risky writings but also because it's 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 a historical document and i think because it's agnostic it's it's really, or not all of it. At least what I read recently is agnostic, and it's which is very fascinating that that would be make canon from a Catholic perspective. Yeah. Um, so my Catholic experience was such that I feel like there was a lot of things that were off book, <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, or like a pick and choose kind of mythology. Like yeah. Um. But yeah, that sounds interesting. What was the language you used? Was it wisdom as spirit? Um, yeah, so and I would equate that as like, um, I think for me that externalizes the idea, which means there's like a communal mm-hmm. wisdom that I find like a fascinating concept. I thought of that obviously in like emotion, like we definitely can connect to the concept that um, uh, recently we can all say, you know, we've been feeling like um, uh, a sense of mourning 
you know, coming out of uh, of COVID, and then we continue in this like weird polarized, you know, and there's certainly like an anger, and, and that's like a communal emotion, right? Um, and 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 I think that that's um, even plays like at a, a more micro level, even within like organizations and whatnot. Like Chris, I think you could probably speak to that um, with work recently, and um, you know that there's there are like even not physically near like there is like a shared communal emotion and i'm i and presenting wisdom that way i thought was really fascinating because wisdom always seems like very personal like i have gained wisdom you know school of hard knocks or whatever that may be but as a a shared spirit is really like a hmm well and i I feel like like the the connection that i i draw and sort of the reason why i bring up like paganism in general is is because it feels very much to me the way that gods and goddesses are presented in in polytheistic religions and like with where like this is the the god or the goddess of this particular like do area of influence this domain like when you are experiencing this thing that is because this god is is like i don't know watching over you or like you know influencing the the events of of the world or whatever and so it's like it's obviously not an old uh idea like you said and like i feel like you know wisdom as a as a woman is probably something that probably comes from greek or roman mythology there's probably you know there's probably something there yeah, greek it was actually yeah. originally written in greek whatever that book was um is it athena who's wisdom i don't think it's i don't i don't i don't know <laughs> someone <laughs> but but that's and interesting too. Allison, who is super into Greek mythology, is very sad for herself. Yeah. She's like, yeah. I retain nothing. <laughs> yeah. But it was valuable until it wasn't, you know? Yeah. But that's the it's thing, is like purpose. you put names on it and like it it Yeah. You know, like I feel like it's more about the it's more about the feeling, man. Like <laughs> Well, that's my question though, is like we can totally say it's about feeling, but and we, we can totally accept that that's a, a shared thing. I'm struggling with that in the concept of wisdom. Like, can wisdom actually be a shared thing that because Chris learned something that I benefit from it and now it's a shared wisdom? Like, I don't know. That seems well, I don't know if it's shared in the in the way where you also hold the wisdom, but it doesn't mean you can't benefit from it. Yeah. Kind of like I raising, hold the, raising tide raises all boats kind of. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I mean, I hold the trauma, but I can still feel the emotion, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I feel like there's, 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 is there a parallel, um, action verb i'm not even sure what the verb would be like chris uh gains uh, gains i guess is it gains wisdom what's the what's the ripple effect to the rest of the um my the, impact on the world as yeah, a result what are you doing? thank you for listening to binary jazz if you like this episode you can subscribe to us on itunes google play spotify and stitcher you can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at at binaryjazz. Special thanks to Serpiente Negra Ensemble for the use of their tracks for our intro and outro music. You can find them online at serpientenegra.bandcamp.com. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the forum on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.